Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the National Quilt Museum. How many people here worked on the quilt? Give them, everybody give them a hand. Also, I definitely like, uh, I, I am the, uh, my name is Frank Bennett, I'm the CEO of the National Quilt Museum, which means I just give these speeches. Uh, the actual, it took a whole lot of my staff to make this happen, so if you please give them applause, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> also, I have to do one administrative thing. Uh, those two uh, taped lines are for the video crew. Uh, basically, if, uh, if you step in between that, the two of them are going to tackle you. And honestly, I said it that way because I want to see if they'll actually do it. <laughs> all right, folks. Well, welcome. Today is your day. We are so excited to have all of you here. I have been excited about this project for a long time. I really just love what you guys did here. And the real reason why has to do with probably the phrase I say most often. I, in my job, I do a lot of interviews, and almost all the time, People ask me, why are you involved with quilting? And I always say, quilters are phenomenally talented artists and even better people. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and what I really love about this story is it's a story about quilting, but more, it's a story about human beings. At the end of the day, Shannon bought this quilt, wanted to take Rita Smith's work, take care of it, which we need to do with all art, by the way, take care of it, finish it, and she asked some other folks to get involved, and a thousand people agreed to do it, not because of any benefit they would get, but because they cared and they wanted to help. And in the end, what you guys have done is create a compelling story that shows to everyone that little bits of kindness can make a big difference. Because at the end of the day, as this has gotten a whole bunch of media, you've shown really, at this point, millions of people that people can come together and do things that are great and significant. And at the end of the day, for me, this becomes a story about art, a really big story about community, a story about kindness, but above all else, it's a story about people. So thank you so much for being here at the National Quilt Museum. We are so excited to have Rita's quilt here today and for a few months. I've loved working with you, Shannon. Just absolutely loved it. Our whole team has. I'm so glad you guys were here. Well, I am going to turn this over to Shannon. Please give her a pause. <laughs> I talk in front of people all the time, and this is the first time I've ever felt nervous. <laughs> Y'all are yeah, okay. Mm, I wrote them down this time so that I could just say them because, dear God, um, <laughs> this is a lot. I, uh, Frank stole my thunder a little, but um, everybody who worked on it, please raise your hand again because another round. So while I have the privilege of standing before you today to speak about the project, this project is equal parts all of the folks in, in this room and who aren't here that were able to work on this project. Uh, my name is Shannon Downey. I'm better known as Badass Cross Stitch. I respond to either. <laughs> um, I'm an artist, craftivist, community builder, instigator. I blend my politics, activism, and art into projects designed to inspire other people to take action, think, discuss, engage with democracy and their community, and find some digital analog balance. I create art to inspire other people to create art. For me, Rita's Quilt is the perfect example of how intention and art can inspire and unify. Uh, <coughs> it started by bringing together the thousands of volunteers who wanted to contribute to the quilt. It was strengthened by the 150 or so folks who worked on the quilt expanded thanks to the millions of people who followed along the journey uh, and its influence continues to grow as the story grows. For me, finding this work in progress in Rita's house and deciding to finish it was a singular act of feminist resistance. It was a way of saying women's stories matter, women's art matters. 
When I decided to ask for help and I got the response I did, I was reminded that humans are amazing. <laughs> As this story spread, I saw manifest what I've always believed, that social media can be used for good. And today, standing in front of you and in this space, I wholeheartedly believe community can be built anywhere. The press love to ask me, uh, why do you think so many millions of people connected to this story? Like 10,000 times they asked me that. <laughs> um, and I, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I think, um, I believe it's because Rita's quilt was a display of unity and common good in a time when humanity seems more polarized than, than ever before. And that I offered hope and joy in a time when those are hard to come by. And it was a loving act done with a generosity of spirit together. So I also believe that Rita's quilt is like a prime example of why women should rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, I've asked some of the folks who worked on the quilt to come up and share their stories, and then I'll say a few more words. But um, importantly, I'd like to introduce you to um, Holly Adams Samet. Holly is a fiber artist who lives in Boston, Massachusetts. She's been a maker her entire life. She embroidered the Idaho hexi for Rita's quilt, and I have personally commissioned her to make several pieces for me <laughs> because she's amazing. Oh, so, welcome, Holly. <laughs> Um, I also wrote some notes down. Um, before I get into the role I played in Rita's Quilt, I wanted to give you a little bit of history about me. I was born in the 1970s, the second of six children on a small farm in Idaho. And my parents were creative and resourceful people, both out of necessity <laughs> and because they had a real passion for it. Um, until I was 12 years old, I went to a tiny little farmhouse school, and my mom made from scratch every item of clothing I wore, every quilt I slept under, and every bite of food that went into my mouth. There were very few commercially manufactured items in my life as a child. My mom is awesome. <laughs> and she has so many skills that I admired as a child, and still do, and I really aspire to have a lot of them. She comes from a long line of makers, which means that I do too. When I was about five years old, before I learned to read, my mom taught me how to embroider. And I remember very clearly watching her pull the fabric really tight in the wooden hoop, and she took out a ballpoint pen and drew some shapes, like a little sampler for me to follow. <laughs> and uh, right away, I loved the satin stitch and French knots, which is kind of weird because I don't think lots of people like those, but I really love those. <laughs> my very favorite stitch, though, is this, the stem stitch, and it remains my favorite stitch to this day. I practiced it over and over till I had the bloody finger um, and until I felt like I had gotten pretty close to perfecting it. And I, I spent a lot of my childhood free time stitching with embroidery. Uh, I can remember transferring pages from coloring books onto fabric and coloring them with thread. And as I aged, my fascination with fiber arts expanded. I learned to sew, I learned to quilt, and lots of other really great hobbies. To this day, I make my living as a knitter. So the internet um, is good and bad. I tend to think it's more good. And it has connected me to so many people all over the world who have a similar passion to me for, for the art of making things. I discovered Badass Cross Stitch many, many years ago. Before she had this wild following she has now, <laughs> um, she was then and still is an inspiring, creative, and very engaging maker. I really admired her willingness to connect with people and to stand up for what she knew was right. She supported my work, as she said, and I considered myself really fortunate to call her a friend. And I'm so glad I finally got to meet you in person. <laughs> when she put out this call for help finishing this incredible embroidery and quilting project, I was so pumped. I knew I had to help. Um, I had no idea the extent to which this project was going to take hold. But I knew that I was a person who had often wondered what would happen to my unfinished project <laughs> if I was in the middle of something when I, when I left. Um, and I knew it was important to help Rita. So 
So I offered to work on the Idaho Hexagon in tribute to the place of my birth. I've lived in Massachusetts now longer than I ever lived in Idaho, but Idaho, I guess, is still kind of home to me. Um, as the project unfolded on Instagram, I was really curious who was going to work on the Massachusetts Square. And I diligently watched the hashtag Rita's Quilt on Instagram, and one day it showed up. <laughs> and it was the, s the Massachusetts Square pulled really tight in a wooden hoop sitting on someone's lap. And there was no picture of the person, it was just the hoop. But there was a location tag. And the location was tagged, the men's room, Stoneham, Massachusetts. <laughs> and I was like, huh. And so I read the caption. The caption says, quote, when crafting is life, but you're a barber and you still have to work. Working on Massachusetts for Rita's Quilt in between clients. And my heart skipped a beat because Stoneham is one town away from the town I live in. I immediately replied to the post in a direct message to the poster and I said, hey, I'm working on Idaho in Malden. We should get together. And very, very quickly her response came back. I just work in Stoneham. I live in Malden. <laughs> I could not believe it. <laughs> we should definitely get together, she said. This really piqued my interest. So I went to her feed and I start looking through her feed and unbelievably, I think I recognize a dog in her post. <laughs> and I think to myself, could this be, could the woman stitching Massachusetts really be Rambo's mom? <laughs> yes, Rambo's mom was stitching Massachusetts. Natalie is her name and she lives two streets away from me, you guys. <laughs> two streets! Her little Maltese Rambo is a constant fascination for my Boston Terrier, Mix Marvin, on our afternoon walks. And I had actually met her once or twice, casually in our neighborhood, enough that I remembered her dog's name. <laughs> so it, this felt like some kind of weird, divine intervention that now Rita's quilt was going to bring us together. The connection with Natalie made me wonder who else in Massachusetts might be working on this quilt. So I went to the Instagram and the Facebook feeds and I put out a little call. There were five of us, five stitchers from Massachusetts, except for dear Mr. Downey, <laughs> who I've met now. So I guess there were six of us. Quickly, four of us made plans to meet at a restaurant locally and to get together and talk. And I cannot tell you how amazing it was we all connected so quickly, so easily, and we fell into very broad and deep conversations about life, about stitching, about all kinds of things. We are four women, very different stages of our lives, born in different decades. There was a soon to be retired substitute teacher, a full-time mom, a full-time knitter, an Iraq war veteran, and a woman in her 20s planning a wedding and finishing grad school. We had no problem talking about all kinds of things for hours, laughing, having a great time. We had varying degrees of skill with embroidery. One of us had never embroidered anything before. One of us is an avid quilter who I know really wanted to be here today, who has years of stitching experience. We took a photo together, each of us proudly holding our square, and the enthusiasm we shared for Rita's quilt really did bond us as sisters. Um, and the support and the care we have for each other extended beyond that night and this project. We are still in touch when I get home. We're going to have a powwow to like debrief. And Natalie and I regularly meet for coffee. We sit on our porches and talk while our dogs kind of tussle. It's just great. And I know that the small sampling of women who worked on Rita's Quilt from Massachusetts is just a tiny representation of all of the women and men who worked on this project collectively. I am really, really proud I got to be part of this. And I'm, I, I wanna thank Shannon for being a connector, a mobilizer, a powerhouse, a total badass. <laughs> and a woman, thank you, yes, to Shannon. <laughs> And I'm really thankful for the work you're doing, Shannon. I know it's important, I value it, and I believe in you. So keep going. Um, 
And to all of you, thank you for coming, the Stitchers. I'm so glad I got to meet all of you in person. Thank you to the Quilting Museum for hosting this incredible piece. And thank you to Rita for a passion that really started a project that has bound all of us together for good. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Holly gets tackled. <laughs> that was an epic ending. Holly got taken off. Um, <laughs> next, I'd like to introduce you to Shay Knox, who stitched the Alabama Hexi. Um, she's lived in Alabama her entire life. She wants to change the narrative about Alabama and the South by connecting people from different walks of life and facilitating different difficult conversations. Um, if I had known I was going to be this emotional when she asked me to speak, I probably would have said no. <laughs> so just hang on with me here. I feel like I've been like had a steady stream of tears ever since I walked in the door and saw the quilt. Um, this is so exciting. Um, so like Shannon said, um, I stitched the Alabama Hex, and um, I feel super honored to be included among all of these talented ladies. Um, I feel like my work is not you know, we're always a little critical of ourselves, but what I lack in any sort of talent, I make up for in enthusiasm. <laughs> so I love, I love being part of this. Um, yeah, so um, just a little bit about me and why I wanted to be part of this project. Um, so needle arts have been a hobby for me since childhood. Uh, my grandmother taught me how to cross stitch and embroider and um, we worked on projects together. And uh, I believe this is why I really love group craft projects uh, and also why I have so many unfinished projects of my own. <laughs> um, I'm sure none of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, working on this quilt has been um, a joyous adventure. That's how I describe it because um, I have been connecting, making genuine connections and communicating with people that I never would have had a chance to meet in my life. And I think that's, that's just a super important um, thing to me. And at the core of um, my beliefs is the idea that language matters. Like the names that we call things matter, um, pronouns matter, words matter. And that is just, that's so important to me. And that got me thinking a little bit about like the origin myth of language, like how we got to talking. And so there's lots of different stories um, from lots of different cultures and religions. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is the Tower of Babel, um, which is the Judeo-Christian um, story where most of the stories go like this. Everyone spoke the same language, uh, some event happens, and then after the fact, um, no one can understand each other, right? And so that's what these stories are. So Tower of Babel goes like, um, all the survivors from the Great Flood gathered into one city and wanted to build a tower as tall as the heavens. And so God did it like the tower, and their punishment was that their speech was confounded and no one could understand each other. Okay. Um, so a second one of these stories is from the Hindu faith, and it's called the World Tree. And it was just a tree that wanted to grow as high as the heavens. Um, and there, the god Brahma discovered the intentions of the tree, and as punishment for being so proud that that tree thought it could grow that high, um, he cut off all of its branches and spread them all over the world, and that's how we got different cultures and languages. Okay? So, really, we all talk a different language. But, circling back to what this means to me, um, I'm about to start crying again. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think one thing Shannon mentioned was how divisive our current political environment is. And I just, I don't know, we're at a time, I think we're at a time and place where in those stories, um, people don't under, we're not understanding each other. Like people are not talking the same language. Um, we all have beliefs that can be held to a point where humanity and someone who believes the opposite of us is completely invisible. Um, and I don't... I just don't think that's okay. Um, so I think that we are really desperate for a common language. And um, Rita's quilt was a work of community 
and um, joy and divinity, and it's a work of art. And um, I think that art, in this case, is what is our common language. So that's what has brought us all together. Thank you all. Crying. That's fine. Uh, the last person I want to introduce you to is Sarah. She's a quilt designer, piecer, long arm quilter, and teacher of textile arts. She's been quilting for over 15 years and long arm quilting since late 2016. Supporting individual crafters and building communities of textile artists is the heart of her work. So that's the formal introduction to her. Um, but you need to know that like, this would not have happened without Sarah. It would not have happened without her generosity, without her mad skills, because, yeah. Um, <laughs> without her giant long arm machine. <laughs> Which, when she volunteered, um, I'm totally adding myself as like a non-quilter. Um, when she volunteered on Instagram, she was like, I'll long arm it when it's time. And I was like, Google, what's long arming? <laughs> And then when I, when I saw what it was, I was like, oh, yeah, shit, we need that. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but more than that, Sarah has spent hours at my house prepping and cutting and mapping and designing um, and, you know, like leading the piecing party and bossing me around in all the best ways um, and uh, has just been a gift in this project. And so I want to make sure that um, she gets a proper introduction. So please meet Sarah. Hello. <laughs> when we were taking the picture, I uh, left my phone up here, and it has all my notes on it. So oh. let me find it. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, hi. Thank you for letting me be the person that made this come together. Um, I am the lucky duck who, besides Shannon, got to spend time poring <coughs> over all of these mini masterpieces that you see up here. Um, Alaska and Georgia were done by Rita. Um, Rita also did the center. We centered her in the quilt on purpose. That is the original tapestry that mm -hmm. needlepoint that Shannon found at the estate sale in early September. Um, Heather Kenyon, who can't be here, is a, a quilt sister of mine who independently volunteered to also quilt um, and help with the quilting. And she and I um, worked, um, I think we spent about 16 hours um, cutting out the hexagons after Shannon blocked them and the process of them all. Um, I, so I want to make sure that she has a shout out. Um, I have participated in bee quilts before, but nothing on this scale. <laughs> um, I love to work with others to create things that are beautiful, especially in today's climate. I can't do much about what's happening in the world, but I know I can make something beautiful that is not only art, but functional. Um, I'm, we're ready for whatever comes. I can be at home for two plus weeks if I need to. I've got enough stuff to do. And work on. <laughs> I've been training for this my whole <laughs> life. Um, because I was brought up by makers. Um, I remember when I kid, my, my parents are both here. My sister is here as well as my spouse. Um, I remember as a kid, my dad had a loom in the living room. We had a loom and a piano. Um, so there, it was art, and it was, it was fun, and it was good. Um, I've technically only been quilting for 15 years, but I've been surrounded by it since before birth. Um, and my grandmother made the most amazing modern quilt when I turned 16 that today would, would, would be worthy of hanging here if it were. Um, but it's not. It's in my house because it's mine. <laughs> So, I, like I said, I can't do much about the state of affairs in the world, but I can say yes to things that I believe in. Um, I started following Shannon on social media about the time of the Women's March, and there is a great big huge hoop that she made that said, I'm so angry, I wanted to stab something 3,000 times. And I was like, that's my girl. <laughs> and uh, so um, 
so when the opportunity came along, I'm like, I want to say yes to this. I, I have no idea if, you know, no idea how many people are going to volunteer or whatever, but sure. And when the time comes, I will long arm it. Um, jump forward to middle, uh, early of November, and with um, Christina and Candace, who also are not able to be here, but they are part of the Wishcraft group um, that hosted our Stitch In, we started talking on Skype about um, piecing, the, uh, quilting the quilt. And I kept going, guys, um, okay, mm -hmm. it's a quilt. We gotta piece it before we can quilt it. Um, and they're like, hey, who knew? Um, and they were like, hey, let's hand stitch this together just to honor Rita. And I'm back there going, these are Y seams, and they're hand stitching with a bunch of strangers. Okay, um, if you are a quilter <laughs> and you you know about Y seams, you'll understand why I was very trepidatious. But I was smiling and nodding. I'm going to say yes. We're going to say yes to this. Um, At no point did we know that you were freaking out. You, that's good. That, that means good game face. I'm often told I don't have a poker face, but evidently I do. Um, so the weekend before Thanksgiving until. December 21st, mm -hmm. um, my world was turned upside down. Um, with Heather, we cut hexagons, we cut the donated fabric. Shannon brilliantly sent some of the fabric that was in huge yardage to a cleaner to have them press it. That was the best $50 that she spent in this whole... 15 yards of 108 inch wide um, muslin is not something you want to iron. So anyway, just a pro tip. Um, <laughs> cleaners are great places. Um, mapping out the quilt, organizing it so that a group of stitchers could come together on December 7th and sit down and in seven hours complete a top. Raise your hand if you were here for this, if you were at the stitching party. One, two, yes. Yeah, there's about five or six of us that are there. Um, and some of the ones that are here are the ones that stayed until the bitter end because it, it, was, it, it was a long day. Um, but hexagon by hexagon, Y seam by Y seam, over the course of those seven hours, with bright lights shining in our face most of the day because of the media attention that we had received, it was stitched. There were so many amazing people that were gathered there that day. My job was kind of just to hang out, and I kept walking around going, I wish I had time to sit down and talk to each and every person that was there because each of us have such an amazing story to share. We would not have participated in this unless we had had our own stories that have motivated us to be present for this moment. Planning the piecing was just a mere organizational task. <laughs> um, by the time we got to the piecing party, I knew that it was going to be hanging here. <laughs> <laughs> so not only was I aware of the incredible trust that Shannon was putting in me, and all of the stitchers who created stars and states, I was keenly aware of the number of people who are going to see this quilt over the next two months. I am a quilter. I know how close they're going to look at it over the next two months. And I also know in my gut that this quilt wasn't about the quilting at all. The quilting for this quilt is just to make the embroidery shine um, because it's to hold it together. Yes, you go ahead. It is. It's to make it shine. Um, to honor the artwork that each of you created. Um, let me see if I can find my space. I will say, um, in quilting it, it took a while to kind of calm down and get to quilt it. I didn't have much time because remember this was like 20 days between <laughs> the time it was put together, um, the time that Kelly Clarkson had us come out to LA, <laughs> missed a whole week of quilting that way. Um, <laughs> but um, getting to the final, as, as a long armor, I worked from the top down, but I actually started with the hexagons and went down and then worked my way back up and did the borders. And I intentionally um, 
did something on the edges of the quilt that I want everyone to know about because it's kind of my, um, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just it's me. okay. It's all right. I intentionally did something on the edges of the quilt that I want to make sure I point out so that you can take this message home. Um, I can put beauty in the world. I can say yes to doing the things that I'm capable of doing. And I left the edges of the quilting open because the United States should be open. Nice. Um, just a second. I'm almost done. Okay. It, was, it, was a, it was a strong ending, but I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. So in December, I personally brought all of the people that I have ever learned from um, to my cloud of witnesses, if you will, to be present with me to help me finish this project. And I accomplished more, experienced more, cussed more, <laughs> and slept less than I can remember. And I, I am a mom, so I do know that. Um, I also, as a result, feel more alive and ready to jump into the next portal of awesome that opens up. So my pearls of wisdom for the day, that for me, and maybe for you too, it's less about learning how to say no to the things that the world thinks they want us to do, but being willing to say yes to new things while being at peace with leaving old expectations behind so that you too can step across that threshold and enter your own portals of awesome so that you can grow. A simpler way to say that, embrace change. It is the only constant in the world that you can count on. Thank you, Shannon, for this opportunity. Uh, so I'd like to thank my parents who are here. Now that I'll just jump to that since <laughs> you just met them. It, uh, it means a lot to me. They flew in from Boston, uh, and it's not an easy time to fly in. Um, and so I'm really grateful that y'all are here. Thank you. Um, there are so many amazing stories within this project, and you just heard some of them. Um, but there are also so many being shared because of this project. And any time I tell the story of Rita's Quilt, like the only thing people want to do is tell me their story, which I, I love, right? But folks who are remembering or reconsidering the art objects in their lives created for them by people that love them, right, because of Rita's Quilt. Um, it's placed a new value and importance on these artifacts for so many people. Rita's Quilt is recontextualizing these stories for people and elevating their importance in their lives. And this is happening because we came together and demonstrated the amount of love, effort, and artistry that goes into making a quilt. I am profoundly excited by this exhibit. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just the number of quilters and um, quilt lovers who will see it because it's here. So I really want to thank the National Quilt Museum team for seeing Rita's Quilt for what it is, which is a museum quality work of art, and for actualizing this beautiful exhibit. And I have to say that I am particularly pleased to be sharing this space with the amazing Social Justice Sewing Academy quilts. And if you have not seen them, you need to go over there immediately. Well, not yet. Let me finish. <laughs> and then go over there and see them. Because um, if you're not familiar with them, I need you to like look them up and learn more and get involved in the work that they're doing um, because they're changing the world. And the fact that the museum I is recognizing that and showcasing the work of these talented young people is just really important, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank Brewer Sewing and Fabricana Fabrics who donated the materials that we needed um, to finish the quilt. They just tweeted me and they were like, oh my god, I'll send you stuff. <laughs> it's like, awesome, thanks. Um, I also want to thank Wishcraft Workshop in Chicago for providing their space and countless of uh, like hours of support for the piecing party. Like we were there late, y'all, and they were just like, "Yeah, we'll order pizza. Let's do this." It was amazing. Um, Evanston Stitchworks for giving us space for our late night binding party. Late, y'all. I was asleep in the corner. These quilters <laughs> flex hard. <laughs> Ooh, they till midnight. Hmm, I'm too old for that. Um, for Women Made Gallery in Chicago for supporting us with an epic afternoon pop-up show. Um, 
And uh, Sarah thanked Heather, but I really want to um, honor the work that Heather Kenyon did. Um, she can't be here today, but she put in dozens of hours on this quill, including figuring out how to send her Rita's map um, when I texted her. And I was like, so I think the map I bought is almost the same size as the one that has to go in the center of the quilt. What can you do? <laughs> and she was like, I got this. Um, and then spent m the entire piecing party making that perfect uh, centerpiece happen. So I'm giddy with excitement to bring Rita's quilt on tour with me beginning in July. Um, and while this tour was planned well before this quilt came into my life, it has really added a beautiful addition to the mission. Um, and thank you for all of you for entrusting me with this piece um, as I bring it to all the folks who help work on it across the country and foreign Canada um, so that they can show it off to their communities. Um, I'm also going to be bringing it to Rita's son, Jim, in New York, uh, who couldn't be here today. Um, and you know, I love a call to action, so I have one. <laughs> okay, great. Because <laughs> this was so fun. We should do more stuff, don't you think? Um, yes. Great, yes. Enthusiasm, y'all. Um, we have seen the impact of one piece of art about one woman on this world through Rita's Quilt. And so imagine the impact that a million pieces of art about a million women and gender non-binary folk could have on this world. Right? Okay, great. I want you to center yourself. I want you to dive into your own story. I want you to know yourself and to share it with the world. I want you to take up space, to carve out time for yourself, and to make art about yourself. And then I want you to send it to me. <laughs> Just a million pieces, no big deal. Um, I have a project that I started uh, before Rita's Quilt called Badass Herstory. Um, and I would love for all of you to visit badassherstory.com, learn about it, and participate in it, and or consider becoming an ambassador. Cool? cool. Awesome. Um, to close, I would like to read you a message from Rita's son, Jim, if I can make it through. <laughs> uh, when I first saw the completed quilt, I had to sit. My legs gave out. It's huge. It's beautiful. It's got so much detail, so much history, and so much effort by you and your team. Well done. My mom was a woman of her time, a child of the Depression. She did all sorts of crafty, thrifty, and useful things in addition to needlepoint and quilting. She could knit, she could bake, she could sew, she could refinish furniture, paint a room, stain an exterior wall, garden, and sing in the choir. Mom belonged to a neighborhood sewing club in the 50s and 60s, and it provided her with an important connection to others who shared similar interests and concerns. I see strong parallels to what you're doing with your needle network, which is the cutest name that I've ever <laughs> been given. <laughs> I was like, oh, trademark. <laughs> I see Rita's Quilt as a kind of feel-good story people need these days. It acknowledges a talented person, a simple woman, and a positive role model. It also shows how many different people can come together to finish a project, and the product of that finished project is Drop Dead Gorgeous. Mom would be so happy and so proud. Nope. And probably a little embarrassed by all the fuss over a project she failed to complete. <laughs> <laughs> she was unique, truly one of a kind. Her quilt remains as a reminder of her. So please extend my deep gratitude to all the wonderfully talented people who worked on Rita's quilt. Thank you sincerely, Jim. So with that, I will say, get out there, build community, make art, smash systems. Everybody give Shannon a round of applause one more time. All right, a few things here. First of all, take your time. Take a bunch of pictures. We've got several folks who are doing video and pictures for several different documentation, social media, videos, Quilt cool Museum TV. I, I want to get all of this. I don't want us to miss any of this day. So you're going to see these three folks walk up to a lot of you and just ask you to tell your story. Please do if you're comfortable doing it. I just want to get all as much of this into things we can send out into the world as we can. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. And we appreciate everyone being involved with Rita's Quilt. Thank you. Mm -hmm.